classroom of the Northern Brewer Minneapolis retail location here with John Palmer. Uh, my name is Jeff, I'm the general manager here at the Minneapolis store and uh, we're happy to have you here, John. Thank you. Uh, this is a real uh, special day for me. Uh, I uh, have been reading and, and accessing your book for information for um, a good 10 years or so now. And um, it's uh, definitely the book that we recommend to uh, our customers and I personally think that it truly is um, the foremost book on um, everything brewing from beginners all the way through even commercial brewers. There's a lot of great information in there and that's the How to Brew book of course. Thank but you. we're here today to talk about your new book, yep. uh, Water, a comprehensive guide for, for brewers. Yeah. We said water, yeah, that's I right. think we okay. should, yes, cheers. <laughs> So, your new water book. Okay. <laughs> what was your main inspiration in writing uh, a book about water? Um, well, it was the fact that uh, uh, I always had a technical uh, problem with you know the the information that we're given for growing. Um, you know, the, temp the mash temperature's got to be this, you know, this is your ideal pH. Um, you know, and you always ask why, you know, what are we trying to do here? Well, it turns out in terms of, you know, mash pH it ha and, and temperature, it has to do with optimizing enzyme activity in the mash. And it turns out these little enzymes work best at, you know, 5.2 to 5.6, and if you want to, um, target the beta amylase enzymes, then you need to be like at 145, 150. And if you want to you know, target alpha amylase, get a little more dextrin sphere, then you need to be at like 150 to 1587 or so. So, you know, <clears throat> putting all those details together um, made me take a step back and say, okay, how does the water set that up? And that was kind of the impetus behind the water book. Great. So, John, who is this book really written for? There's a lot of information in this book, and some of it's um, very easy to understand, and some of it gets very much on the technical side. Is this book written for beginning brewers, advanced brewers, professional brewers? Well, um, all kidding aside, I, I wrote it with the hope that every level of brewer would be able to use it. Um, it but the, the question of water is not as applicable to extract brewers. Um, it really is more towards all grain brewing and mashing where water becomes, understanding how water works becomes critical. So um, it, it is written towards the all grain brewer. Um, I included uh, water sor understanding water sources, how to read a water port, how to adjust water chemistry for mashing, um, and then went into, you know, uh, water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment, because these issues are becoming more and more important for professional brewers, especially as the brewery, the brewery gets larger and uh, they're, you know, sewering more and more waste from the brewery. Sure. Well, I think we've all heard it said that if your water tastes good, then it's good for brewing. Is that really true? Um, in, a, in just a very general way, um, you can have, you know, if you, if basically, it, it's almost the, the opposite is more true. If your water tastes bad, then it's definitely bad for growing. Um, but you can have, you know, water such as we're drinking here that tastes very nice. That's actually quite high in alkalinity. And so alkalinity is the villain when it comes to achieving the correct mash pH and having that, thereby having the beer pH turn out yeah, you know, optimal, where um, you, want, you want beer pH to be right because that allows the flavors of the beer to be best expressed. Um, it's not too dull tasting, it's not too sharp tasting, it's just right. You can differentiate the malt and the hops and the different malts that you used in that beer uh, if you're at the right beer pH. So um, if the water alkalinity is high, it may taste fine, 
but it may be cause your mash pH to be high and therefore your beer pH be, to be high, making the beer uh, not taste bad, but not taste as good as it could be. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so you mentioned how this book would be very beneficial to an all-grain brewer, but how much should a new brewer, a beginning brewer, somebody that's just getting into the hobby, be concerned about their water? Really, uh, even for professional brewers, water is one of the very last things they address. Um, you know, much more critical um, to overall off flavors and beers or sanitation is your, you know, your yeast management and fermentation temperatures. All these things, you know, can have very profound effects on beer flavor. Um, even with highly alkaline water, providing it doesn't taste bad, you are going to make beer. And you can probably make good beer, beer that you're not ashamed of serving to your friends. Um, however, uh, I tell people that the different, you know, when you once you understand water and water chemistry and how to apply it, it's the difference between a good beer and a great beer. So they, you know, it, it's really this is kind of the last thing that you really address. Um, if you're not an all grain brewer, then it's less critical to getting the, the beer um, good than say fermentation temperature. Sure. How big of a role does water actually play in beer? I mean, how much of beer is actually water? Yeah, anywhere from um, 90 to 95 percent. You know, it's you know, beer is mostly water. So, again, the going back to the adage, you know, if the water tastes good, the beer should taste good. Well, that's you know, that's generally true. Um, the it's a question of do you want that beer to be good or great, and that that is where the uh, this book becomes helpful. Sure. Well, everyone's water is different. Mm -hmm. Depends on where you live, uh, how it's treated, what the source is. Um, can you talk a little bit about what causes differences in water quality? Sure. The water reports that we get uh, from the city, from the water supplier, um, they are uh, based on the Clean Water Act. You know, federal law for water cleanliness, water quality. And there we're concerned with uh, contaminants mainly. Uh, pesticides, herbicides, um, toxic, you know, heavy metals in, in the, that may be in the ground, uh, like arsenic or chromium or, uh, you know, different things that could, you know, be injurious. Um, the brewer, of course, is concerned about those, but what we are really interested in from a brewmaster point of view is how much calcium is in the water, how much alkalinity is in the water, sulfate, chloride, um, you know, things that affect the flavor of our beer and, and the pH and so on. Are there any general characteristics of great brewing water? Things that people, no matter where they live, can do a certain thing or two that makes sure that the water they're using makes good or even better beer than what they're making now? Yeah, the water should have at least 50 parts per million of calcium, uh, probably more like 100. Uh, and the, the role of calcium in, in water and brewing is to uh, promote beer clarity, promote uh, good truck formation during the boil. Uh, you know, these things, it helps, it helps the the process of brewing helps the brewmaster produce a good, clear uh, beer, um, as well as you know, uh, just a general flavor stability or um, firmness to the body of beer. Um, from there, it's you. You need to look at the style that you're brewing and say, you know, how much alkalinity do I need in this water, if any, to get the mash pH right. There's a concept called residual alkalinity. It's the cornerstone of setting up the mash pH. Uh, you kind of start there and then look at your grain bill and see how they come together to help you understand, you know, is my mash pH going to be in range or is it going to be a little high or maybe a little low? Uh, and understanding residual alkalinity helps you there. So that number depends on the style and your source water. Um, depends. So, as I was looking through your book, I noticed that one of the chapters 
especially, has to do with adjusting your water for the style mm -hmm. of your beer that you're making. Why is that important? Can you explain a little bit why maybe some of your styles would work better with some waters and, and maybe why not? Sure. A lot of people are familiar with the classic brewing cities uh, and you know the classic beer styles that have come out of those cities. We talk about how you know uh, Dublin water is high in carbonates and it helps uh, create help create stouts. And in general, that's true. Well, there's, there's some interesting uh, details that I won't go into now. But the fact that higher alkalinity water can help balance a an acidic grain bill, dark grains, uh, highly ro highly kilned and roasted grains have different degrees of acidity due to melanoidins and polypeptides and so on in the grain that are formed during the malting process and the roasting process. Um, and so to come down to the ideal mash pH range of 5.2 to 5.6, you can take an acidic grain bill, balance it with a little more highly alkaline water to get to that uh, pH range. If you have soft water, that is water or water without much alkalinity in it, um, then you can use a lighter or paler grain bill and still come to that same uh, ideal pH range. And so that's that's how you can, or you know, that's kind of your first cut at say, you know, how appropriate is this water for these styles versus this water for those styles. Sure. Well, homebrewers use water for a number of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, not just brewing beer, but chilling right. and uh, cleaning and uh, rinsing. Is the quality of your water or the additives that are in water for those other things other than what goes into the final product, is that important? Yeah, it is. Uh, one, one thing that we go into in the book, or we devote a couple chapters to, is you know, understanding you know, from a uh, production point of view, you know, brewing as a manufacturing process, um, I've got a water source and I'm going to, you know, you kind of your first consideration for that water is how does it brew with the beer, you know, the, the minerals and so on we've been discussing. But for cleaning, you don't want hard water. You want water that, you know, to, you want it to be, to not leave deposits on the kettles, you know, calcium carbonate deposits. Um, so you want softer water. You may install a water softener in your brewery after you know, after splitting off, say half the water to brewing processes, you may take another pipe and soften that water and take the calcium and magnesium out. So now that you've got you've got a water that's not that's going to rinse easily and clean easily for your brewery, uh, you may take uh, another uh, uh, portion of that water and de, -air de aerate it, um, take the oxygen out. So now you can use that water for helping push beer around the brewery, you know, send it to the bottom line or what have you. Sure. Um, do you make anything other than beer with your water? Do you make ciders or meads or sakes? And do you alter the water if you do that? I don't. Um, I, maybe that's something I need to work more on. I, uh, I like mead and I like, I like cider and all that, but uh, I really kind of stuck to understanding beer as far as uh, my own brewing and, and the water book. Uh, but I should, I should, you know, look into these more. Well, we have just uh, one final question for John. It's a very serious question. It actually comes from uh, one of our team members at the Milwaukee store. And uh, what he wants to know is, uh, what kind of beer would you add to make a pancake better? <laughs> I would probably use Oktoberfest. And why is that? Because the, the maltiness of the grains, uh, would complement the the pancake flavors, and if you used uh, some caramel malt in, in that beer, uh, that residual sweetness would come across in the pancake. You would want uh, a beer that has really relatively low levels of hops. Hops are, are good in coffee, try it, um, and but they're not so good, especially if you put um, a, a very bitter beer into something like pancakes, where you're actually putting you know, syrup on them and so on, where you're looking for a sweeter uh, you know, meal uh, or food, uh, the, the bitterness can kind of clash with what you're expecting uh, in the pancake. 
Um, blueberry pancakes are a good example. I mean, there you have, you know, some tartness, um, you know, and which is some or some acid, which is a nice counterpoint to the sweetness of the pancake. But tartness is different from bitterness. Bitterness would kind of really clash with pancakes. So. Well, there's our answer, folks. Oktoberfest with pancakes. I take pancakes very seriously. Obviously. <laughs> well, John, we want to thank you for coming up to Northern Brewery in Minneapolis. It was, a, it was a great time having you here and uh, doing some book signing. Certainly appreciate you signing my book tonight. That was great. And uh, we definitely look forward to collaborating more with you uh, in the homebrew scene. So cheers. cheers.